right. So like uh, Lori Nordstrom the other day, I don't have a PowerPoint, but unfortunately, like her, I was not in Mexico. Uh, I don't have that excuse. I was in Texas, kind of close, but not really the same thing. Um, <clears throat> and that, you can forget that title of that presentation that she just said, that's not exactly what I'm going to be talking about, probably tie in some of those things. Um, I find myself uh, flying by the seat of my pants lately, like probably a lot of you guys, you're very busy and, and getting things done just in time. Um, so the, the concept of what I'm going to talk about today came up on a conversation I was having with Iris and Dan. Um, and we were talking about the potential of uh, going into the CCAA and, you know, maybe there's this decision where it doesn't get listed and, you know, this apprehension that we're all having about whether or not to sign on. So I got on a bit of a soapbox and I rambled for a while and Iris said, you need to say that at the next right away meeting, right away's Habitat meeting. Um, so I didn't write it down. I didn't record it. So I'm going to try to remember what I said. And um, I did a lot of thinking about this yesterday, last night, this morning. And really what I want to talk about is, is my story and how it relates to where we find ourselves today. Um, why is the monarch important to me? And what does it really represent in my career and uh, moving forward? So probably like a lot of you, I got into the environmental field because I love nature. I love the environment. I love being outdoors. I love being outside. Um, but now I find myself working for a fossil fuel-based industry. So I work for NYSource, and NYSource is a fully regulated gas and electric utility. Um, we have 3.5 million gas customers. We've got 500,000 electric customers. We have an annual infrastructure program between $1.6 and $1.8 billion dollars. That's a lot of money, a lot of infrastructure, a lot of stuff that's being built. My team has a responsibility for doing the natural resources permitting for all of those projects. Um, we manage uh, across our, our, I guess I should tell you, we're in Indiana, uh, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Maryland, Massachusetts, and Virginia. So we're, we're mostly out east. And most of those uh, states are just gas companies. The only electric that we have is in Indiana. Um, across all those uh, comp, uh, states, we manage about 8,000 acres of right-of-way from electric to gas to just other lands that we might be managing. So it's not a lot, but it's not insignificant. Um, and most recently, our company has made a commitment to go coal-free by uh, 2028. So that's pretty exciting. It changes a little bit of the dynamic within our company and what we're focused on. <clears throat> So, Pam, you mentioned earlier, you know, working at a utility, we tend to be the tree huggers. You know, we, we get labeled, um, and honestly, it's true. You know, we, not necessarily tree huggers, but we believe uh, in the land ethic, you know, that Aldo Leopold talked about, um, that we have this obligation to stewardship. And working within the utility and seeing those thousands of acres that we're managing, I see tremendous opportunity to do things. And we've done a lot, uh, you know, uh, grassroots efforts to try to do conservation. We've got partnerships with some of our uh, adjacent landowners, whether it's national parks, state parks, land trusts, nature preserves, and things like that. We've promoted integrated vegetation management on our rights away. Um, work to grow a pollinator program, again, more of a grassroots approach. Um, I've had a lot of other ideas that I've thrown out there. And because there wasn't a solid business case for those ideas, they, they didn't work. And what I've found with ideas is it's, you might have an idea, and it's not a bad idea. It's just an idea who, whose time hasn't come yet. So, the land ethic that Aldo Leopold talked about, he said it's an evolutionary process, and he says it's, it's an ecological necessity. The first two ethics, to remind everybody, because I'm sure you all study this in school, the first two ethics, one deals with person-to-person -person relationships, 
The second ethic deals with people and society, and that third one is the is the ethic that we have to the land. And what I've identified or what I've seen change in my 18 years with NISource is that there's been more of a focus on sustainability and sustainability metrics and things like that. And I look at the biodiversity requirements and I see that land ethic coming up. And I, and I think now is the time, although Leopold was right, it was just an evolution. And we're at that point today where I think the land ethic is applicable. So NISource has been on the Dow Jones Sustainability Index for several years in a row. Um, but when we specifically look at the environmental and the biodiversity, we've got a downward trend. And the reality is we're barely on the Dow Jones Sustainability Index. Um, if we don't improve things, we're not going to make it next year. And anybody in, you know, who does sustainability or who feeds into those reports, you see things getting more challenging. And what we've seen on the biodiversity is it's gone from this qualitative, uh, you know, you could write a really nice flowery statement about all the things that you're doing and, and, you know, a little bit of greenwashing, you get the points and you get in, but it's really moving to more of a quantitative thing. You know, where are you measuring? What are you doing? And you have to show improvement. Um, <clears throat> so we're in the process right now of developing a robust biodiversity statement. I've, if you're a utility, I've probably been to your website and just know that I'm going to steal some of your information because there's some really good stuff out there, Tim, I'm talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> so we as companies have made these biodiversity commitments. So, and then we're over here, we're talking about um, the monarch butterfly. So how is it that we can go from making these biodiversity commitments to promoting pollinator habitat on our rights away, these species that are potentially going to be endangered and are going to have restrictions to our operations. And I, that's where the, um, that's where the can, the CCAA comes in, right? So you've got these sustainability commitments, you've got a potentially endangered species. These things are coming together. I think now is the time where it makes us, strong business case to do that. When we talk about the CCAA, a lot of the conversation in, her, in the room and in individual conversations has been about the, the, uh, the covered activities. We're going to get, you know, we're going to have all these covered activities. We're going to be able to do our work, have our operational flexibility, which is the term I like to throw around. But the CCAA was really developed to promote conservation to preclude the listing. We can't forget that. So, and secondary is then getting that protection from enforcement if it is listed. So, bring the biodiversity statements back in and, and look at the original intent of what the CCAA is. And from NISource's perspective, from my perspective, listed or not, we have an obligation to help the monarch butterfly. So, going forward, like I said, regardless of, of whether or not it's listed or it's not, we're going to sign on to the CCAA. Um, we've talked about what's going to happen with a listing decision or a potential non-listing decision. We know that there's going to be this tumultuous time. What exactly is going to happen? Um, we don't know, but we are committed to conservation. We are making these biodiversity commitments, so we're going to enter in. We're going to do our work, kind of sit back a little bit and watch things settle out um, and not have to have a knee-jerk reaction, right, to say, well, what's the court going to do? You know, is it going to go this way? Is it going to go that way? And there's been a lot of uh, examples thrown around. The, the wolf, right, it's listed, it's not listed, it's listed. Um, I think somebody mentioned the lesser prairie chicken was a similar species that um, kind of went back and forth. Um, there was another species, the dune sage lizard, where's Dan? I think that's the one. Um, so the, the lizard was not listed because there was a CCAA out there, um, but there's a petition to have it listed now, and they're going to be withdrawing the CCAA. And one of the reasons that was cited, not it's not the only reason, but it's something to consider, is lack of enrollment in the CCAA and then lack of conservation work being done. So 
that's my that's my position. And like I said, so I've I've gone from this this transition from uh, all these good ideas, you know, not really having a solid business case, believing in a land ethic, seeing it come together with biodiversity, and now we have this great opportunity. And what the monarch represents to me is this strong business driver to do the conservation that I've been wanting to do uh, on the lands that our company owns. Um, so if you want to know more about like the cost benefit analysis and the details of that, come to our breakout session this afternoon. We're going to really deep, uh, uh, dive into some of the, the mechanics of that, the, uh, the numbers and, and how that all makes sense. I'm done. So thanks. I can take questions if anybody wants to question me. Any questions? Comments? Reactions? You did a pretty good job replicating that conversation. So, yeah. yeah thank you. Get off my, what, what was it that Stan called it? Not a soapbox? A soap stool. Yeah. That's the Dutch interpretation of soapbox. Soap stool. Okay. Cool. Thanks, Brian. Yeah.